Дякую, Владко. І мені сказали, що треба зробити представлення на пів години. I was told to give a half hour uh, speech. I think it might be a little bit less than that, Walter. Um, because I, uh, I think it's always good to have an opportunity for uh, questions and answers. And I'll return to my formal notes, but I, I, I just wanted to underline something that uh, Walter had pointed out, because I was told to keep my thoughts to a topic of, uh, to the topic of why a free and stable and prosperous Ukraine matters to Canada. And I will come back to that particular point in my formal notes. But most Canadians, even if they don't exactly understand, there is an intuitive understanding that Ukrainian Canadians are one of the foundational peoples of Canada. And it's, you know, we've been here 125 of Canada's 150 years. But it's not just the length of time. It's the depth and breadth of our contributions over those 125 years. We not only physically transformed Canada at a time when U.S. settlers were moving north into what at that time was known as the Northwest Territories, predating Saskatchewan and Alberta's uh, uh, status as provinces. And we always talk about, you know, the CPR, the railroad, the, you know, ribbons of steel that bound our uh, confederation together. But there was a real threat that what had happened previously in California, New Mexico, Texas, could well happen in Canada's prairies. They needed people. And it was bush. It wasn't step. It was bush. It was a harsh bush climate. And it was our people that came and transformed that bush into those golden wheat fields of Canada's west. Canada may well have ended up with a very different geography if not for our people's hard contributions in building the country. But it's not just a physical contribution. Not quite a century later, we redefined what a Canadian is. And as was referenced, and I'll speak to that again in my formal notes, Senator Yusick, in his maiden speech in Parliament, for the first time talked of a concept of a multicultural Canada, a Canada which up to that time was defined as being bicultural, English and French. And he rejected that notion and redefined who we are as a people. And it was a decade of the hard work of, at that time, the Ukrainian Canadian Committee of lobbying three different prime ministers that finally in 1971, the former Prime Minister Trudeau announced that henceforth Canada would be known as a multicultural nation. Today in a, in a world which, in which we often see a descent, even in the democratic West, into isolationism, xenophobia, nativism. Canada is a shining beacon. Our concept of multiculturalism. In fact, we show in a city like Toronto, where half of our population was born outside of Canada, we're showing the future. Walter, uh, I will return to my formal notes now, <laughs> but I thought after Walter had referenced that, 
uh, that it was important to just, just really emphasize the importance of our contributions. Ladies and gentlemen, as the chair of the Canada-Ukraine Parliamentary Friendship Group, and I must note, by the way, that uh, after the Canada-US Parliamentary Group, this is the second largest parliamentary group on the Hill, with over 90 not only signed up, but paid up members. And as a Ukrainian Canadian, I have the honor of bearing witness to the his I, I had the honor of bearing witness to the historic signing of an unprecedented number of bilateral agreements between Canada and Ukraine over these past two years. A greater number of bilateral agreements than with any other ally. In July of 2016, along with the representatives of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, we witnessed the signing of CAFTA, the Canada Ukraine Free Trade Agreement, in the Presidential Ceremonial Hall in Kiev. Of particular note, this was Prime Minister Trudeau's second official state visit after being elected, the first being to the United States, our biggest trading partner, and this has been the first free trade agreement signed by our government. Watching my fellow Ukrainian Canadian at that time, the Minister for International Trade, Christian Freeland, sign the treaty was especially poignant. Christian and I first met in KU, not in Canada, in KU, back in 1992 as young and idealistic Ukrainian Canadians who were intent on making a difference in the ancestral homeland of our parents and grandparents. The minister, as a journalist, and myself as an, a Canadian organizer of Ruch, Ukraine's Democratic Front. And how amazing was it? And, and it's hard to describe the emotions watching the minister who was pivotal in making sure that this agreement became a reality. 25 years later, the two of us accompanied Canada's Prime Minister for the signing of this historic agreement between our two countries. Why would the Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement be such a priority for Canada? Our bilateral trade is quite modest, $289 million per annum over the past five years on average. And why was CAFTA's implementation specifically referred to in Prime Minister Trudeau's mandate letter to the Minister for International Trade, Christa Freeland, upon her appointment? And why would this free trade agreement be the sole such agreement to have the unanimous support of Canada's House of Commons, including our Socialist Party, this was the first time the NDP had, in fact, voted for a free trade agreement in the House of Commons. And we also had the support of the Green Party and the Bloc Québécois. It was unprecedented. However, our cooperation, our bilateral cooperation, goes beyond just trade. This past spring, on April 3rd, I was honored to be present as Canada's Minister of Defense, Harjit Sajan, and Ukraine's Minister of Defense, Stepan Poltorak, signed the Canada-Ukraine Defense Cooperation Agreement. This agreement came on the heels of the announcement a month earlier by now Foreign Affairs Minister Christian Freeland, extending Canada's training mission, Unifier, in Ukraine for another two years. Through Project Unifier, Canada has trained over 5,500 Ukrainian soldiers. Operation Unifier is a critical piece of our multifaceted military support for Ukraine. Our brave Canadian men and women in uniform are providing valuable military training, supporting Ukraine's defense of its sovereignty in the face of Russia's illegal occupations. Through Operation Unifier, through the mission, we will continue to send our Canadian soldiers, allied with our American, British, Danish, Lithuanian, Polish allies, to help train and equip Ukrainians as they head to the front lines 
its trench warfare, the daily artillery barrages, and death. Our Liberal government has also lifted the previous limitation on travel east of the Dnipro River for our military. Today, Canadian soldiers and officers are able to travel into the east, to the borders, to the front. And as a result, there are a number of training centers in eastern Ukraine where Operation Unifier is actively engaged in its training mission. Additionally, our government has co-founded the Ukrainian Defense Reform Advisory Board this year and placed Jill St. Clair, a former Assistant Deputy Minister of Defense, on this body with a team of Canadian experts to help Ukraine as Ukraine works towards the ambitious goal of becoming NATO compliant by 2020. During the past year, there have been so many ministerial trips in both directions between Canada and Ukraine that there are too many to list off. And each seems to conclude with yet another bilateral signing agreement. For example, as recently as 10 days ago, during the annual Ukrainian Day on Parliament Hill, Prime Minister Volodymyr Groysman and the executive of the Canada-Ukraine Parliamentary Friendship Group, the Canadian ambassador to Ukraine and the Ukrainian ambassador uh, to Canada, all of the interns of the CUP program, as well as the Ottawa Ukrainian-Canadian community, were invited to witness the public signing ceremony of the Canada-Ukraine Civil Service Memorandum, a project that will help to train public servants in Ukraine. As we strengthen our bilateral alliance and relationships, we've also not taken our eyes off of Ukraine's historical enemy and a revanchist, imperialistic Kremlin. We've added to and strengthened our sanctions against Putin and his gangster kleptocracy most recently on October 4th. The government delivered on its promise to, to pass Magnitsky legislation this year with the Foreign Minister Christian Freeland working to ensure unanimous support for the passage of this key act through the House of Commons. On October 18th, Magnitsky sanctioned legislation received royal assent and a week ago this past Friday, on November 3rd, Canada sanctioned 30 individuals involved with the incarceration, torture and murder of Sergei Magnitsky. And as I mentioned last night, a week ago, when Sergei Magnitsky's widow and son visited Parliament with Bill Browder, the champion of the Magnitsky legislation globally, it was particularly moving when I introduced the Magnitsky family to the Prime Minister in the House of Commons lobby. And as I mentioned last night, but it's worth repeating, the Prime Minister responded to Mrs. Magnitsky's thanks by saying, we need to do so much more. Two days later, we announced our additional sanctions against Russia using the Magnitsky legislation. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, in a short two years, the government has put together a comprehensive and broad package of supports for Ukraine. All of these agreements and legislative initiatives are not just about trade defense cooperation, improving Ukraine's civil service and the sanctioning of gross human rights abusers in Russia. It must be seen through the lens of Canada's special relationship with Ukraine, as well as a geopolitical lens. Everyone within Canada, especially elected representatives, are aware of Canada and Ukraine's special relationship. And it's always referenced in quotation marks, the special. The word special is not just used as an adjective, but it's a term defined in an agreement first signed in 1994, the Joint Declaration of a Special Partnership between Canada and Ukraine. 
This agreement was reaffirmed in 2001 and again in 2008. Although Canadians and our symbol of the maple leaf are warmly received in almost every country of the planet, there's no country where Canada and Canadians are more warmly welcomed than in Ukraine. In fact, affectionately welcomed. Many Canadians not only supported, but literally stood shoulder to shoulder with people of Ukraine during the independence movement from 1988 to 1991, and during the democratic revolutions, the Orange Revolution of 2004, and the Revolution of Dignity of 2014. Since Russia's war against Ukraine began, here in Etobicoke, I've had constituents who volunteered on the front lines, one of whom spent a year fighting on the front lines. Others, such as highly skilled surgeon, Dr. Oleg Antonishin, who was at our banquet last night, who's traveled to Ukraine with surgical teams to do incredible humanitarian work, cranial and facial reconstruction on soldiers wounded in Russia's war against Ukraine. For the past 25 years, tens of thousands of Ukrainian Canadians, as well as many of their Canadian friends and Canadian elected representatives, from members of parliament to prime ministers, have been directly engaged in building an independent and democratic Ukraine. In fact, not just for us, but for many Canadians, it's personal. However, the ties between Ukraine and Canada run even deeper. And I've referenced this earlier in my off-the-cuff remarks. Ukraine has given Canada its most precious of gifts, its people. 1.4 million Ukrainian Canadians trace their ancestral roots to Ukraine. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, on this 150th anniversary, the sesquicentennial of Canada, in many communities, the 125th anniversary of Ukrainians' first settlement was also celebrated. These pioneers transformed the bush of the prairies into the golden wheat fields of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. And as one travels the prairies, the golden paysage of the wheat fields is regularly broken by grain elevators and the domes of Ukrainian churches. In fact, there isn't a city in Canada where golden church domes don't stand as a testimony to the presence of Ukrainian Canadians. And Ukrainian Canadians not only transformed Canada's physical landscape, they gave us a deeper understanding of who we are as a nation. And as I mentioned before, the term multiculturalism was first used by Senator Yuzik in his main speech in 1963. And it was the Ukrainian Canadian Committee that relentlessly lobbied the federal government through the 1960s on this issue. A government whose official policy at that time was biculturalism, English and French. And it was due to our communities, our organized communities, determined efforts that former Prime Minister Trudeau, our current Prime Minister's father, officially announced the federal policy of multiculturalism in 1971, thus transforming our understanding of Canada and who we are as a people. And this unique perspective has informed our place and role in the circle of democratic countries in the world. Today, Putin's Russia poses the gravest, and now I'll turn to the geopolitical lens. Putin's Russia poses the gravest geopolitical threat to liberal democracy and our Western values. And Ukraine and her people are on the front line. When Putin, a sequential violator of international treaties, ordered his armies to militarily invade and annex Ukrainian territory, 
He violated the letter and the spirit of every post-World War II treaty guaranteeing the integrity and sanctity of international borders. Accords which have largely brought us a grand peace in Europe since World War II. Today, no small state bordering Russia or any large and non-democratic state could ever feel its borders to be secure. A military invasion and annexation on the false pretext of ethnic grievances has not been seen in Europe, and it's important to underline this, has not been seen in Europe since the 1930s and Sudetenland. Soon after the Russian invasion and annexation of Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula and the West's initial confused and weak response, Russia began its land invasion of Ukraine in the Donbass. And as, as all of you in this room are aware, today, three and a half years hence, the result is over 10,000 dead, approximately 2 million Ukrainians are internally displaced, and there's a hot, frozen conflict within, Ukraine, uh, within Europe. Weekly, we receive reports of additional Russian military equipment being sent into Donbass. Tanks, armored personnel carriers, artillery systems. However, the Kremlin has not only launched war militarily, and there's not just an ongoing propaganda war, there's a Kremlin economic war against Ukraine. Russia has been Ukraine's largest trading partner equivalent in importance to the trading relationship between Canada and the United States. At the same time that Russia militarily invaded, Putin shut down trade with Ukraine. Imagine the consequences of the U.S. shutting down trade with Canada. It's within this context that Canada has signed our Defense Cooperation Agreement and the Canada-Ukraine Free Trade Agreement. Both are clear geopolitical statements of support by Canada for Ukraine at a time of Kremlin military aggression and economic war. Today we collectively in the democratic West face a global hybrid war against our liberal values. It's amorphous and borderless. However, it does have a hard military front line, which runs from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea. And on that front line, there's an active component in the Donbass. Democratic and independent Ukraine, a major European state of 45 million people, faces an existentialist threat from a Russia that has launched a military and economic war against Ukraine and a hybrid war against us in the liberal democratic West. Canada and all countries that share our values must stand with Ukraine. Canada is willing to lead in many of these efforts and we need all of our allies to partner with us and with Ukraine. Slava Ukraini, Slava Kanadi.